if you're a dictator, you don't want any kind of popular mobilization outside of your control. So you don't want independent trade unions, you don't want independent NGOs, or you don't want people protesting in the streets unless it's to support you. I'm Roland Oliphant, and this is Battle Lines. I've made wartime decisions. I know the choices are never clear or easy for the leadership. I just find bombs and I find dead people, but it's a really scary thing for me. The tyrant was once thought to be an endangered species. Generalissimos, general secretaries and supreme leaders appeared to be disappearing across Asia, Africa and South America as they were replaced by democratic revolutions, the occasional coup, sometimes even foreign invasion. But now they seem to be back. From Vladimir Putin to Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un, there is a new generation of leaders for life. But are they as strong as they look? Marcel Drissus has written a book looking at that exact question. How tyrants fall? Is there a way to help them along the way? And is it always a good idea to do so? How did you end up deciding you were going to write about the death, the assassination, the coups, the revolutions, the, the dyings on the toilets of tyrants? I've been really interested in non-democratic systems of government for quite a while, which might be uh, an odd thing to say. But what really set me onto the topic and what made me want to understand it as best as I possibly can was some time that I spent in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So once I finished studying in the UK, I wanted to see the world a little bit, and I ended up working in the Congo, as one does for a brewery. And while I was there, there was a coup attempt that didn't affect me directly, but there was some shooting in the vicinity that made me rather nervous. And, and at that moment in time, I felt that something should be done, but nothing really was. And part of the reason for that was because there are some countries in the world that have such an instability, uh, or constantly, really, that you have these types of phenomena all the time. So there might be coup attempts, there might be assassination attempts, and so forth. And that coup attempt that happened while I was in the DRC failed, but it really made me want to understand why. You know, why did the ruler survive? How did he manage to stay in power for another couple of years? Why didn't he fall? And would there have been a way to make him fall? So that's how I got interested in it, really. And then after that, I did my PhD on the subject. And obviously now it's tragically relevant. It's, it's incredibly relevant. And, and the fascinating thing about the book is how you take data sets from a very long kind of sweep of history. You know, you talk a lot about Africa, but you look at 20th century, you talk about 18th century, all, all kinds of um, situations. And we talk about how tyrants fall, but before that, you've really got to talk about how they come to power. And, and the, the hypothesis you have, one of the hypotheses you have that under, underpins the entire book, really, is this idea of a treadmill, the idea that once you become a tyrant, whether you're a, a Soviet dictator, whether you're a kind of personalized fascistic dictator like Hitler, whether you're a, an African general who's come to power in a coup, whether you're Vladimir Putin, it's very difficult to retire. Could you walk us through that? Before we talk about that, I should note that I'm not here to make people feel sorry for, for some of these horrendous leaders, of course. So I'm more trying to explain, not trying to justify what happens. But yes, I think there is something that could be described as the dictator's treadmill. So once you ascend power as a dictator, and as you said, it doesn't really matter too much what type of dictator you are, you have to make some very difficult trade-offs to maintain power. And the reason for that is that losing power is incredibly dangerous. So when you're a democratic leader, let's say you're a British prime minister, and you're no longer in office, you might be able to look forward to a nice retirement surrounded by a family, or perhaps you're going to found a charity or something like that. But if you're a personalist dictator, your odds of a tranquil retirement are very low. So when a study looked at this, what they found was that 69% of personalist dictators end up in exile, jail, or killed once they lose power. So as you come into power, you do all these horrible things to stay in power. You make a lot of enemies. You now have a target on your back. You've been engaged in large-scale corruption. You've broken a million laws, even in these systems of government. So once you lose that power, just about anything can happen to you and just about anything can happen to your family. So because of that, you have to do everything that you can in order to stay in power. How exactly are we, are we then defining dictator? Because we talked about different ways of coming to power here. There are different kinds of dictator. You have, you know, 
the big one out of the air, the throw down Hitler is the, you know, the dictator's dictator. But there's others, there's people like you know, Vladimir Putin came to power relatively democratically and you have this slow kind of crushing of the uh, the democratic space until suddenly a, a frog's been boiled and there's someone who is a de facto dictator. You have someone in a uniform or you have someone in perhaps as part of a one-party system. But the, where are you drawing the line here between a dictator or, I don't know, a king or a democrat or an imperfect kind of republic? What's your kind of definition? Yeah, I deliberately wanted to make the book broad because I'm interested in non-democratic systems of governance more generally. So I didn't want to confine myself just to personalist dictators or perhaps dictators in charge of uh, party systems or theocrats like in Iran and so forth. So I try to make it broad. And looking at tyrants is charming in that sense because, of course, the definition of a tyrant is, is quite broad. But there are really two ways of looking at it. One is that you look at cruel leaders who use their power not for the good of the country but for personal gain. And then the other one is really looking at people that have come to power outside of the laws of the system in which they operate. And by focusing on these tyrants as opposed to dictators, I can look at a broad range of people. But of course, you're right. And that's one of the difficulties of looking at this, even though there are a lot of similarities between, let's say, Xi Jinping's China and Vladimir Putin's Russia. Obviously, these systems are also very different. Uh, and you know that comes out when you look at something like succession for example. But by and large, I wanted to look at non-democratic systems of government in which very few people at the top have a lot of power and they rely on a very small group of people to maintain that power. And that's what really distinguishes them from democratic systems of government. So if you're somebody like Joe Biden, for example, and you want to defend the White House, you want to get reelected, you need a lot of supporters, you need a lot of voters Obviously, you don't need every single American voter because what really matters are a couple of swing states, but that's still a lot of people. And on the other end of that spectrum, you have something like North Korea, where Kim Jong-un really only needs a couple of hundred people in order to stay in power. So now we know who we're talking about, and we know that once they're in power, they've got to stay there because if you try and retire, you're in trouble. You could end up in a prison cell, you could end up dead, you could end up in exile. So even if you get tired of being a, an all-powerful ruler, there's not much way out, which means either in practice, you're either you're going to die in your bed and be a dictator for life, or you'll be pushed out in one way or another. Now, off the top of my head, you identify several. Stop me if I've got one of these wrong. We've got revolutions, assassinations, coups, foreign invasions, natural death, pretty much. Is that pretty much the options? Rebellions. Rebellions. Every, every okay. now and then, every now and then somebody gets ousted by a rebellion. It's not easy, but it happens. Brilliant. So talk us through these then. So th the way that I look at these dictatorships is that to maintain power, you need to deal with a variety of very challenging trade-offs. And the immediate threat that you have to take care of are the people closest to you. So these would be the palace elites, or the people smiling at you as you walk down the corridors, these types of power brokers in the capital. And in addition to that, it's the men with guns. So most importantly, it's the generals. You need to maintain the support of these two groups, or at least the critical mass of these two groups, at all costs. If you don't manage to do that, you're toast. But the problem is that even if you manage to take care of those people, either by giving them an incentive to support you or by discouraging them to defect in one way or another, you then run into problems down the line. Because by prioritizing this very narrow group at the top, you're inevitably going to make a lot of people very angry. So if, let's say, money comes in and you could be building schools somewhere in the countryside, what you should really do if you want to maintain power is to make sure that it ends up with the people that are already rich. If, let's say, you have some money to spend on armored vehicles for uh, the military, really what you should be doing if you're interested in staying in power is to divert a lot of that money to the greedy generals. Because if you lose the greedy generals, you might end up with a coup. But most of the time, the ordinary soldiers that might die because they don't have that armored vehicle have very little influence on whether you stay in power or not. So you're forced to make these trade-offs. And as you prioritize this narrow group at the top, you don't really get away from the problem. You're just kind of postponing it until another day. And there's the risk that it, it comes home to, to, to haunt you, so to speak, in a couple of years. So that, that's your risk. You've got a pie, you're dividing up the pie. And the thing is, you've got a balance you're going to give slices of the pie to. 
And if you're forced to neglect the public, you might end up facing rebellion. Tell us about what goes wrong if you fail to keep the men with guns happy or the palace elite. One of the, the, the biggest headaches, I suppose, for the West or, or the democratic world at the moment is probably Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, people like that. These are people who don't look like they are vulnerable to, at least as far as we can tell, to mass rebellion. Of course, we know that at the beginning of the Ukraine war, there was an awful lot of narrative in the West that, okay, all you need to do is make the Russian elite unhappy by sanctioning them, and they will turn on Vladimir Putin, and he will be toast. And that obviously hasn't happened. Why not? Managing the elites and the sort of the men with guns, like I said, is the, the priority. That's the most important thing that you could do. So because these people have that much power in these systems, they are also the biggest threat. So if we just walk through a coup, perhaps, there are a lot of things that you can do as a dictator if you want to prevent coups from happening. So if you look at, let's say, the British military, you've got this unitary organization, and it's more or less designed to fight. It's designed to actually go abroad and fight some foreign power or it's designed to defend the UK from foreign attack. But if you're a dictator, that's not really what you want your military to do, at least not as a priority. The main thing that you want to make sure is that the military doesn't become a threat for you. And there are a number of steps that you can take in order to make that happen. So instead of having one big military, what do you want to do, for example, is to split it into smaller parts. So you might want to have a regular military. Then you might want to have some sort of militarized palace guard that does more than just guard you, but is also able to fight. And then maybe you want to have some sort of Republican guard that is recruited from the masses. And the reason for that is that you want to avoid a scenario where the generals come together and basically decide to overthrow you. So you constantly want to have a scenario where every general that is even thinking about overthrowing you has to consider the possibility that he might have to fight against some other faction of the military. And that makes it less likely that they try because, of course, these people have no death wish, right? They might want to get rid of you, but they don't want to end up having to fight the, the palace guard or you know, the, the Republican guard and so forth. And you want to repeat that, essentially, with uh, the intelligence services as well. So you want to make sure that everything overlaps, nobody's in total control but you, all the information flows through you. So that's the first thing that you want to do. And with the palace elites, it's really about finding the right balance between rewards and punishments. Because you can't go too far either way. If you go too far rewarding people for their quote-unquote loyalty, which obviously is never assured in these systems, then you might end up strengthening to them to such an extent that they can become their own little power center and they could become able to challenge you. But if you go too far the other way and purge people for no reason, you might have these cabinet ministers sitting around and they, they could start sweating because they see that the person left to them and the person right of them is no longer there and they've somehow disappeared into a gulag somewhere. That's a point that is very dangerous for dictators because they could then get together and say, look, we're going to get rid of him before he get, gets rid of us, right? So you have all these little calculations that you have to make. And I think we underestimate how difficult it is to get that right over and over again because the problem doesn't go away. And to answer your question about Putin in particular, Putin has expended a great deal of time and resources to stymie the threat from the street. So you know, you've got these foreign agents laws and so forth that make it extremely difficult for the streets to erupt and for Putin to really be challenged from the streets. So I think when we look at Putin, what we're essentially left with is the hope that either the men with guns will one day realize that a lot of these deaths in Ukraine have been unnecessary. For example, if the Ukrainians gain the upper hand again, and then you could see something like mutinies, like we saw with uh, Wagner, for example. That could be one realistic scenario. And the other one with the elites, I think, in, in the context of Russia, is extremely difficult to achieve. Because, yes, we can make the lives of Russian elites more difficult. But realistically, I'm not sure that we can make it as difficult that they would be willing to take the risk to challenge Putin to get out of their predicament. Because... A, their life is not really miserable enough for that. And B, the risk is massive because he's so powerful. So I think looking particularly at Russia, our best hope would be the military. That's very interesting. Putin's an, an example of a, of a dictator who seems to be balancing these pressures you described quite well. Could you give us some examples of people who haven't managed to juggle these things? One example that I looked at that I found absolutely fascinating was a dictator... Uh, in Equatorial Guinea. So this is during the Cold War, and he became the, in game, his name is Masias Ngema. 
He became the first president of independent Equatorial Guinea after he gained independence from Spain. And he really illustrates what I was just talking about with this trade-off that you need to make in purging and in using repression against the elites that keep you in power. And his problem was not so much that he used brutal violence to keep people in line, but he lost his mind. And I'm not saying that figuratively. I mean, he literally lost his mind. He was so mentally ill that he became delusional. So not only would he walk around his dictatorial compound crying out the names of the people that he had killed, which is disturbing, but there's an episode in which he asked his servants to lay the table for eight guests, but nobody arrived, which, okay, but he talked to these people, to these guests, as if they were there, but in reality, he was all alone. And as it became evident to the people around him, the people that kept him in power, that he was no longer able to differentiate between friend and foe, they became worried that he's just going to go ahead and, and kill them, right? Because he's genuinely lost it. And as a result, they overthrew him and he was killed uh, by his nephew. And his nephew is still in control of Equatorial Guinea today. And that brings us to another question, doesn't it? Which is that you talk about a culture of coups, don't you? This point that once you've had a coup, one coup in a country, they tend to keep on occurring and you can get into a situation, perhaps I think you described experiencing yourself in a democratic republic of Congo, where it's almost the expected thing. It's almost as, not to play it down, but that this is the way power changes hands in that political culture. How easy or difficult is it for a country to fall into that trap? And is there a way that that pattern, that habit can be broken? It's extremely easy to fall into the coup trap, and it's very difficult to get out of it. So when you look at a country like the UK again, let's say you have a minister of defense. Let's say John Healy is upset with Keir Starmer for some reason or other. But he's not even going to consider the possibility of uh, plotting a coup against number 10, presumably. And that's for a number of reasons, uh, including the fact that the UK has not had anything that could be called a coup for literally hundreds of years. But in other countries where you have these coups regularly, there's now no longer a norm against the military getting involved in politics. And once that norm has fallen, you then see it over and over again because everybody involved has to consider the possibility. And once the, there's a real possibility of it happening, you, you want to be first. And once that possibility exists, you also have elected politicians then starting to move against the military and trying to make sure that the military is not a threat. And then in turn, this might get interpreted by the military as these elected politicians coming to take away their privileges and so forth. So it's an extremely, it's an extremely difficult trap to get out of. And it's quite damaging uh, because, of course, coups are very damaging. Oftentimes people die. Uh, it, it reduces people's trust in institutions as a whole. That said, there's also a debate uh, among political scientists over whether sometimes a coup can be a good thing. Because there are a lot of countries in which coups are the only realistic possibility to get rid of these nefarious leaders. Of course, it would be preferable to have some sort of peaceful revolution because that is more likely to create a positive outcome later. But if you're in a country in which the only real option to get rid of somebody is something like a coup or an assassination, then doesn't that mean sometimes that can be a good thing? What happened in Sudan recently? Right. Would you fit that in? The army and the RSF kind of back the revolution and then you end up with a full military dictatorship and now we have a civil war between two dictators. Does that fit into that coup trap kind of thing? So Sudan is obviously tragic with tens of thousands of people affected. What is so interesting about Sudan to me is that it really shows the importance of succession. So in the book, one of the things that I look at is basically what happens once the dictator goes. Because generally speaking, we're not just interested in getting rid of one tyrant, but ideally we're looking for an improvement in some way. So ideally a democracy. But oftentimes that doesn't happen. I started asking myself, okay, how, how does succession work? How do people decide who comes next, essentially? And I went quite far back and looked at the research related to the European Middle Ages, which might sound boring, but it's actually quite exciting. So initially the system that you had was that if the king would die, power would pass to his eldest brother which is logical because that's the next oldest person and perhaps they've already been around for a while. So they have some stature and they can reassure the palace elites that the system itself is going to remain intact and keep moving forward. So there's a high chance that they might support him as the new king. But very quickly, what happened was brothers would start 
to kill each other. Because if you're the oldest brother and you're starting to become a little bit old and maybe there's only a five-year age difference between you and your brother and you want to get a chance to become king, you might think, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help a little bit and then kill him. So that created a lot of instability. And then one alternative was that they would pick the youngest child of the king. But the problem with that is if you pick the youngest child and you might have, I don't know, like a three-year-old, that three-year-old cannot possibly assure palace elites that the system is going to survive because he has no connections, he has no experience, and so forth. So eventually what they settled on was the eldest child of the king. And the advantage of that is that the eldest child has a big gap to the king still, so he doesn't have to kill his father to become king himself. But also, he has a little bit more experience, he has a little bit more connections at the court in order to reassure everybody that things are going to keep moving. The reason why I say this is because succession is still a massive problem uh, for dictatorships. It's a huge weakness of these regimes. Again, democracies are extremely good at this. Rishi Sunak goes out the door, Keir Starmer comes back in, everything keep, keeps moving along. But in a lot of these systems, there's no real succession process. So every time one leader goes, it risks turning into open warfare in the street, maybe even civil war, because there's no effective mechanism to agree on anything. And this is also where some of these differences come in, though, for example. So if you look at Xi Jinping's China, for example, which is based on a party, there is some mechanism to choose the next person. And that reduces the chance of things going catastrophically wrong were she to die. But if you look at something like Sudan, where you really have none, none of this infrastructure, it's essentially a free fall, and that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. And fascinatingly enough, this means that even today, family is extremely important in a lot of these systems when it comes to succession. So when you look at Syria, for example, it's no coincidence that the current leader is named Assad, and the father was also named Assad. And that's not because this Assad now is a great leader that everybody wanted to be in power. But when Assad the Elder died, the elites needed to find somebody to carry the flag. And they chose the person that is least risky to them. And in that case, that wasn't Assad, because what they were most afraid of was this type of open warfare, because that means the money is no longer flowing, you no longer have the power, or you might even end up dying. So in that scenario, it's better to just pick another Assad, because things are more likely to keep moving. I wanted to speak briefly about the art of assassination. You note in the book that Benjamin Disraeli claimed that assassination has never changed the course of history. Is that fair? Because as you, put, you, as you point out, when everything else is closed down, where you can't have a revolution, you can't have a coup, you can't, you can't have a rebellion, the ballot box is closed down, when everything else is shut down, one of the last options left to someone who wants to get rid of the dictator is murder, assassination. Does it work? It depends what we mean by work. Assassination can work in the sense that, like you say, in those type of systems, it's often the only thing that is still a possibility. And the reason for that is that uh, even a coup, for example, requires some sort of coordination. So you might not need a lot of people, but you need some soldiers to get together and, and get it done. Whereas an assassination theoretically only takes one person in the right place at the right time with a knife or a rifle or nowadays a drone, perhaps. Even. So... It can work in the sense of getting rid of the dictator, but the problem is precisely what we just discussed. In the absence of any type of succession mechanism, the probability that somebody that you and I would want to get rid of is going to be replaced by a flourishing liberal democracy is rather low. That said, not to endorse assassinations more generally, but you know there, there are some scenarios that one could probably imagine in which you don't even need a flourishing democracy for it to be worth it. Sometimes, perhaps it's enough to remove one tyrant from power to then have another tyrant, but perhaps that is somebody that you can establish some sort of guardrails with. Oh, I would push you for some examples of that from history. Well, I mean, there are some people who might argue that if Vladimir Putin were to be removed from power, not by us, but let's say by somebody in Russia, again, the likelihood of that leading to a flourishing liberal democracy in Russia would be extremely low from everything that we know. Every number, every study that you can find will tell you that if Putin goes, Russia is unlikely to become a liberal democracy. But if it were to happen, perhaps the next guy is somebody that we can find some sort of civilized way of interaction with and it reestablish some kind of guardrail. I want to ask you about the lessons here for outside powers 
us in the West, per, put bluntly, looking at this, looking at dictators who perhaps we want to remove, perhaps we have a problem with them. We know that the West doesn't always have a problem with dictators, of course. We're well aware that the foreign policy is, can be somewhat pragmatic, sometimes in embarrassing ways. But countries on the outside, what are the lessons here? You've got options. You could, I suppose you could try and fund a rebellion. You could try and stoke a coup from the outside. You could, even if you wanted to, you could invade as the United States and Britain invaded Iraq to overthrow Saddam Hussein in the early 2000s. From your study, what are the options? Is there any one of those that stands out as the sensible thing to do or does it depend on circumstances? The boring answer is that it depends, of course. So let's take regime change wars first. The, the track record of regime change wars is abysmal. It doesn't mean that they've never worked. And obviously, as a German who's enjoyed freedom from the moment that he was born, I'm not going to argue that it's never justified to use force to remove a tyrant from power. But generally speaking, the track record of regime change wars is abysmal. So I'm going to put that to the side for a moment. The general strategy to get rid of these people is you need to look at three things, basically. One of them is you need to weaken the incumbent. The second thing is you need to empower alternative elites that could replace them. And the third thing that you need to do is strengthen the masses. And the reason for that is if you just weaken the incumbent and you empower the alternative elites, you are very likely to end up in a scenario where one dictator walks out and then the next dictator simply walks in. So you need to strengthen the masses somehow. But the problem with this, of course, is that oftentimes that's extremely difficult. So there are plenty of countries in which Western democracies could make a big difference in terms of promoting democracy. But when we look at the most destructive regimes and the regimes that we're most interested in, like Vladimir Putin's Russia or Xi Jinping's China or Iran, that's not going to do the job. So really then, the decisions that we face are extremely difficult. And I think in a lot of cases, the best we can do is give people a little bit more of an option to help themselves and get ready for the moment when there might be something of a window of opportunity. So we need to be ready to strike at that point. Because like you said, there are other options. In Russia, you could be, for example, encouraging sabotage of oil pipelines. You could provide safe houses to assassins. You could encourage mercenaries to rebel against Moscow and so forth. Everything that we can do that would have a genuine chance of making Putin struggle is likely to be extremely costly, both in blood and in treasure, and it's not likely to remain covert. So just as dictators have these trade-offs in trying to maintain power, we have these trade-offs in trying to figure out what we can do to weaken them. If I was um, the modern dictator, and I'm sorry I keep talking about Putin, it's because I worked in Russia for a long time. It's the person I tend to think of a lot. But, but look, he's got this obsession with what we call color revolutions. And the narrative you get from Moscow, if you speak to any kind of Russian official or diplomat or anything else, I'm pretty sure they genuinely believe this. They're not making it up. It's that things like Ukraine's Maidan or the Orange Revolution or the Rose Revolution in Georgia, all these uprisings during the 1990s and or late 90s through the 2000s were orchestrated by the West, by the CIA, or they'll point to kind of George Soros's Open Society Foundation and things like this. Usually we kind of, you know, poo that, oh, you're being paranoid, oh, it's an excuse, you don't understand stuff on the streets. But there is a fascinating part in the book where you talk about the difficulty of talking to people involved in democracy promotion and how those people are reluctant to talk, partly because they don't want to call attention to themselves and discredit it, and they don't want to take away from the credit of the people actually on the streets and stuff. Is there a degree of truth to this, to this paranoia about open society foundations and things like that? So in general, if you're a dictator, you don't want any kind of popular mobilization outside of your control. So you don't want independent trade unions, you don't want independent NGOs, you don't want people protesting in the streets unless it's to support you. And even then, dictators are sometimes wary that those kind of protests could get out of control or constrain them somehow. So in an ideal scenario, no, you, you don't want any type of NGOs financed by the West. You don't want Western powers training journalists in your country. You don't want Western powers to help assure the free flow of information for activists. You don't want any of those things. The effectiveness of these types of measures, I think, is difficult to truly determine. 
And obviously, the, the Kremlin has a massive interest in portraying all of this as coming from abroad. Because if you can say, look, it's all these foreigners coming here and stirring these people up, then you don't have to admit that there are a lot of people in Russia that are unhappy with the way that things are going. But I think peaceful protest in general is a really fascinating topic in this context, because you would think that armed opposition is always more dangerous to these types of regimes, because you have this dictator and he's got his military and, his, and he's got all the policemen and so forth. But in reality, peaceful protest can be extremely dangerous to these type of regimes. And the reason for that is that they have something that is called a participation advantage. So if somebody asked you or asked me whether we want to take part in an armed rebellion, likelihood is we would not be very keen because A, it sounds hard, we might die, and at least you know, I can speak for myself, I probably wouldn't be very good at it. But when you have peaceful protest, everybody can participate. A pensioner can participate, children can participate. And that means that oftentimes, once you don't manage to suppress peaceful protests right at the beginning, the numbers can very quickly go up. And as these numbers become bigger and bigger, you can then be forced into a situation where you have to decide whether you want to use violence or not. And if you do use violence, you risk causing a backlash, which can bring more people in the street and make your position more difficult. But if you don't use violence, then really you're telling people that you've been bluffing when you told them that they were not going to be allowed to protest. And the way that peaceful protests can ultimately bring down even these vicious regimes is because they split them. They split the governments. So I looked at the end of the German Democratic Republic in my book, for example. And what ultimately happened there is that the regime couldn't agree to mass murder. They had all these people in the streets. They had told them not to march. And when the moment came at which they would have had to give an order to shoot, they couldn't agree to do it because the worst thing that can possibly happen is you give an order to shoot and then your security forces refuse to do it. Because when that happens, you lose all control and all hell breaks loose. That's all for Battle Lines this time. Please join us again next week for more of The Telegraph's best foreign reporting. Goodbye. Battle Lines is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our news, analysis and dispatches from around the world, subscribe to The Telegraph or sign up to Dispatches, which brings stories from our award-winning correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a live blog on our website where you can follow updates on Israel and Gaza as they come in throughout the day, including insight from contributors to this podcast. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Battle Lines on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it really helps others find the show. As disinformation is a particular problem during conflict, we are relying on your support more than ever. Battle Lines is part of wider Telegraph foreign coverage in our podcasts. If you're interested in finding out more about the war in Ukraine, you can listen to our sister podcast, Ukraine the Latest. Battle Lines is produced by David Dagahi and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.